in 10 seconds. Hey everyone, Michael Unger here, Program Coordinator at the HR McMillan Space Center. And we're kicking off a really exciting partnership with Let's Talk Science. And the local faction of Let's Talk Science just happens to be led by Morgan Alford. And I'm joined by Morgan right now. How's it going, Morgan? Hi everyone, I'm good, how are you? Awesome. So I'm really excited about this partnership because um, normally when people will come into the Space Center, you know, we show them a planetarium show and maybe we do some uh, crafts or hands-on activities, of course, can't do that now. Um, so now we get to do these uh, in our homes and you're gonna help us every week do that. I think it's really exciting. We are super excited about this partnership as well. Not only do we get to be doing more hands-on activities, which has been really hindered because of the circumstances right now, but we get to focus on space, which isn't something that we necessarily always have the opportunity to do. Awesome, well, well maybe tell us a little bit more about what uh, Let's Talk Science normally do, and uh, because they're a nationwide organization, right? Correct. So we are quite large at this point. Um, we were founded years ago in uh, Eastern Canada in London, Ontario at um, Western University there. And since then we've expanded all across the country. We have over 30 sites nationwide. And what we are is a national outreach organization focused on improving science literacy in youth um, between the ages of kindergarten and grade 12. But this really, when we have community events and large events and stuff, we capture a much broader audience. So we're actually um, doing these sorts of activities with people of all ages. Parents are usually the most excited to be involved. <laughs> um, and there are a variety of different programs that operate underneath the Let's Talk Science umbrella. So we have a teacher partnership program, for example, where we pair a volunteer with a teacher and they go into that teacher's class three times throughout the school year in order to do hands-on activities over and over with the same group of youth. We also have larger community events at places like Telescience World, um, sometimes HR McMillan Space Center, where we um, are only interacting once with the youth, but we we interact with a lot at one time, doing certain things depending on what the activity or event um, of the day is. Yeah, that's really great. And um, I'm glad that you mentioned teachers because right now, you know, I think a lot of parents are sort of becoming teachers as well uh, with their kids at home. So this is a really great opportunity, you know, to connect. And if you're watching at home and you have questions about all these activities every week, like please send them in and Morgan and I uh, will be happy to answer uh, all of those questions. Um, and uh, you yourself, Morgan, um, you are, uh, what, what's your title at uh, Let's Talk Science uh, out at UBC? So at the current moment, I'm the community events coordinator. Right. Um, so I'm in, involved in uh, planning these sorts of larger activities and um, implementing them. This weekend, we were supposed to be hosting the Science Rendezvous, which is a nationwide um, event. And what Science Rendezvous is all about is uh, having kids come to university campuses and engage in a whole bunch of different programming in all different areas of science, technology, education, and math in a really fun, hands-on, immersive way where they collect prizes throughout the day and they're there with their parents, so it makes it a little bit more comfortable for them to be mm -hmm. doing these things. Um, and yeah, I'm moving from the community events coordinator position into a more executive position come September. So this is kind of my last chance to be doing these events. I'm really excited. Awesome. And, and while you're out at UBC, you're not just doing these events, you are also going to school to be a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your passions and uh, what you uh, hope to study? get into I later. You. I don't get asked this question a lot. Once you are in graduate school, people kind of stop asking because they get scared of what you study. <laughs> but um, what I'm um, involved in, I'm a doctoral student, so I'm working on my PhD in microbiology. Um, it's a very interesting time to be a microbiology student right now. Um, it's one of the only times, in fact, where when you say I'm a microbiology student, people's eyes don't glaze over instantly. They actually want to engage in a conversation with you. And my project specifically is focused on understanding bacterial pathogens, which are harmful species of bacteria, in the context of respiratory diseases. So diseases of the lungs and the airways, like cystic fibrosis, for example. Um, for those who don't know, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. And what happens if you have this mutation in the gene 
involved, um, you secrete a lot of mucus into your airways and that's a really good place for bacteria to get in and thrive and grow. And so we want to understand what exactly, what kind of metabolic or what kind of cellular program is being triggered in that mucus that allows them to thrive. So essentially you're studying to become someone who's going to save people's lives in the future is what you're saying. Hopefully that's the idea. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That sounds amazing. Um, well, let's get into this week's activity, which is our place in the universe. And uh, all, all this week, uh, we are delving into this topic of scale. You know, when we talk about the scale of the universe, it, um, it's quite overwhelming sometimes. And I've talked to a lot of people when um, you start to tell them about, you know, look up and you see these tiny little dots of, uh, of light up there and those are stars, but to actually start to describe how far away they are, you know, and um, the magnitude of just the galaxy that we live and that even beyond that galaxy, there's even more galaxies. So quite often what we do is that we just kind of talk about like our own neighborhood. And the way that I kind of describe this is like, you think of like the world as like the entire universe. So our solar system, we're going to like zoom in to like maybe one of those countries in the world, but even like zoom in even further to maybe like a city and maybe zoom in even further to like, you know, one street. And that's kind of like our little neighborhood. So you've got an activity this week that kind of helps us kind of even talk about our local neighborhood. What do you got for us? So this week we are looking at um, building a solar system, a model solar system uh, with paper mache to scale. So what that means is we're actually building the planets to be relative size to one another that's accurate. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot in planning this activity, um, not yeah. only in the actual size of the planets that are in our little neighborhood, but the distance between them. I had no idea how vast it was in some instances and this really puts it into perspective for you and it's a fun way to really visualize it in a three-dimensional um way um and i came up with a lot of questions like more the more questions i answered for myself the more questions i started to ask myself about our place in the universe yeah and i really still just can't wrap my head around the fact that earth is this little pale blue dot in the speck of a massive expanse of space and it kind of <laughs> makes you feel insignificant. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me more about some of these questions because I wonder if some of the kids at home or maybe even the parents, you know, doing these activities, maybe they'll have so, some of those similar questions. What are some of those questions that came up? Well, for instance, what happens on these other planets that are nearby to us and if those planets are more similar to us, us being Earth, yeah. um, then planets that are more further away in our solar system in terms of maybe what their climates or temperatures or conditions of possible life on these planets could be. Yeah. Um, and I really started to think about that because I realized that Mars is quite proximal to Earth, relatively speaking, and is the one where they have, where other scientists have explored in terms of living. And I wonder if that's because the conditions are more, more similar and more appropriate. Well, you know, you, you've kind of hit, hit, hit on something there because you talked about our neighbors and our two neighbors, of course, as we're going to see in the video, are Mars and Venus. Now, Venus is actually more nominal to the Earth. It's about the same size. It does have an atmosphere. And back in the, like, the 1940s and 50s, actually, people thought Venus was probably the better chance to find life than Mars was just because of its size. But after we explored Venus a little bit more, we found that it is a very hellish world because of those thick clouds it's super hot it's got a really thick dense atmosphere it's like being at the bottom of an ocean so there's many reasons why venus like quickly became a place that wasn't going to be good for life but mars you know even though it's smaller it doesn't have as large a gravity as the earth it does you know have a lot of good possibilities um but of course we're talking about life as we know it you know so everything we know about life comes from this planet which is why we explore space. It's like we're, we're going out into our laboratory to try to find other examples. And the further we go out and make these discoveries, um, we can learn more about 
life on this planet and us ourselves. So um, I think that those are really fascinating questions and hopefully people at home um, and ask some of those questions and we'll be happy to delve into them. So uh, yeah, Morgan, let's get into our uh, video that you made for us and everyone at home. Um, please send us your questions or any questions about making this activity. Absolutely, enjoy. <laughs> so, Today we are learning all about our place in the solar system and what better way to learn about our place in the solar system than to build our own with the planets being the relative size that they are in our actual universe to each other. Um, so there are a total of eight planets in our solar system. There used to be nine, but now there's eight and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and each of these eight planets are different sizes, of course, um, and are pretty massive in the real universe, but we can scale that down um, and look at them and according to their sizes um, on a relative basis, which means compared to one another. Um, before we do that, I just wanna say, if you're under the age of 13, You've got to have parental permission to be uh, tuning in and crafting along with us today as we build our solar system. Um, as well, we are going to encourage you to use supplies that you have already available to you in your house. So I'll be giving lots of examples of substitutions you can make for the materials that we need today in order to get building. Um, so relatively simple, super exciting. I'm glad you guys are tuning in. Let's get right down to it. The first thing that we're going to be doing today is collecting all of the materials that we need to build our planets. First up, we need a small bowl to make the paste um, of our paper mache in. Our paste is just going to be consisting of a little bit of all-purpose flour and some water. And we all know that all-purpose flour is like gold these days, very hard to find in the grocery stores. And we don't want you rushing out to the grocery stores if you don't already have it in your home anyway. But what you can use alternatively if you don't have a uh, all-purpose flour is some drippy glue. Um, also, uh, to combine with the flour, we need some water. So I've just got some lukewarm water here in another bowl. And what I'm going to do now is put a little bit of flour into my smaller bowl. That'll do. And then add in the water in parts just to make a thick paste. You want the consistency of your paste to be like pancake batter. And then you take your little claw and you claw it up. You just mix with your hands. This is gonna be messy. So, don't be afraid to just dig right in there. Now you really don't want any little lumps in your paste. You want to get those out just by grabbing them and getting the water fully incorporated with the flour. And that's looking pretty good. Now we've got our paste made up. The next thing we want to do is take some newspapers and some scissors with the help of a parent or guardian if we're under the age of 13 again. Um, and you're just going to trim up your newspapers into little strips about an inch wide like so. And you want enough strips to cover uh, quite a few balloons. Like I said, there are eight planets um, in our solar system and we're using balloons. We're going to blow these up to create um, the circular shape that we need uh, to be covered. So these are going to be what we use on the inside of the planets, eight of them of different sizes. So I've got these smaller ones here, they're actually water balloons, um, as well as these larger ones that are, again, different shapes, different sizes to em um, emulate the different uh, planets in the solar system. And we're just gonna blow those up to various sizes. Now we've included the sizes of the balloons that you need to try to approximate um, in the PDF uh, instructions attached to the video here. This is quite a big one. This would be about the size of Earth or Venus for our solar system. But what you're gonna do to figure out exactly which planet is, which is take a ruler and measure the diameter of the balloon at its widest uh, point. So, you've got your balloon now. We've got to start paper macheing it. So, you take a strip of newspaper, 
dunk it in the paste. Again, it's supposed to be messy. And just pop it right on there. And you want to smooth out all the excess over top of some newspaper that you've laid out on your workspace. Make sure you're not dripping all over the place because, well, it's supposed to be messy. You don't want to make too much of a mess. Not just yet, at least. And you want to smooth the paper onto the balloon. notice that I'm layering these in such a way that we are actually building upon a single layer of paper mache. So our planet will have about two to three layers of newspaper all throughout it at any part of um, its structure in order to make sure it's staying very strong. And again there's no real like best way to do this. You just want to get in there, you want to get messy, and you want to have fun. And you just want to cover um, all of the showing parts of the balloon two to three times. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it's supposed to actually be more kind of sticky and messy and um, not perfectly smooth. No planet is perfectly smooth. Um, think about Earth, for example. We've got mountains and we've got valleys and deep seas. Um, lots of different uh, gains and reductions and elevation all over the surface of the planet. So the less smooth, the more accurate your planet actually is. And now this is looking pretty good. So what I'm going to do with this guy, now that he's all covered, just give him one last little zhuzh and feel around and smoothing. And then I'm going to put him on a, a planet stand that I have set up um, in my drying room which is just in the next adjacent room. Your stand could be anything like a uh, coffee mug, an empty coffee mug. Um, you could even hang the balloon by its tie and a string to some sort of drying rack. Um, you just really want this somewhere that's warm, it's dry, it's going to get hard, and we're going to be able to paint on it. Once your planet has been drying for your set amount of time, you're going to come out with something that's pretty hard and firm. Now if I squeeze this, it's not really going to bend at all. If I tap it on the table, it sounds pretty solid. We know we're ready to paint. What we want to do first is start with a base coat um, of a white acrylic paint. This is going to really um, cover up all the newspaper look of the planet and give us something really good to work with um, to decorate further. Um, if you don't have white acrylic paint, you can just decorate straight onto the newspaper. You can try covering with a white cardboard paper. Um, you can also use uh, spray paints or you can dissolve um, just more flour and water and do another coat of paste. Uh, you won't get really the same kind of look as paint, but hey, what can you do? I'm going to use an old Tupperware container as my paint tablet today. Um, and so I'm going to take my white paint. I'm going to take my painting tablet where I'm going to put my paint and I'm going to give myself a nice healthy dose of white. And then you want to find something to paint your uh, planets with. I didn't have any paintbrushes at my disposal so I'm using an old makeup brush today. Um, you know, girls gotta do what a girl's gotta do. We're going to dab right into the white paint and just go for it. Uh, so it's important to have newspaper down today because we're going to just rest our planet on top of the newspaper. We don't want to damage our tables or any of our working spaces at home. So now we've got our planet and we've got it fully covered in the white acrylic paint and we need to let it dry before we can proceed uh, with decorating our planet to look like the planet it is supposed to look. Um, if you've got the same acrylic paints as me, they dry pretty quick. 
Um, it'll be about 15 minutes just out in our drying room. While my balloon was out drying, I got my workstation here set up for um, the next uh, set of painting. And so I've added some more acrylic paints. I've got some glitter here. Again, if you don't have acrylic paints, you can use any sort of kitchen household spices. Um, parsley is really great for green. Uh, things like paprika are really good for red color. Um, you can even mash up some blueberries for blue, add some water to it, and those will really make some household paints. I know it sounds crazy, but give it a try if you have to. And um, when I was drying my planet out um, in the sun, I actually took some string here and I cut a small piece off and I hung my planet by its tie on a piece of string and then just tied it right up outside in the sun. And again, it only took about 15 minutes and here we have our dried uh, planet with the white base coat and we're ready to start decorating. So. Um, prior to decorating, you need to figure out which planet is which according to the sizes that you blew your balloons and covered the paper mache earlier. What I'm going to encourage you to do at this stage is look up each of those planets, make a little cue card. Um, so let's say this is meant to be Earth. I would make up a little cue card that says Earth, put it with this planet, and then look up on the internet if you have access to the internet. Earth and see what it looks like and write down on the cue card what you want your planet to look like, which in this case would be blue for the water, the expansive water bodies on our beautiful planet, and green for the land masses. Um, and you also want to write down a few interesting things about this planet. So something interesting about Earth um, could be that it was once a uh, it's believed that it, there was once one supercontinent, so all of the land masses were at one time connected to each other and formed a supercontinent called Pangaea. Um, and you could find lots of interesting little facts like that about the other planets as well. Um, let us know in the comments below what you find out about your planets um, and which turns out to be your favorite based on what you research. And then you get down to the decorating business according to what you found out online about the planets. And again, if you don't have access to the internet, um, you're probably not watching this right now, uh, but if you don't feel like doing that, you can just paint your planets however you feel. Really let your creative juices flow. I'm going to try to be quite quick at getting my blue uh, base color um, onto my earth because I want to use green uh, glitter for the land masses rather than green paint because I don't happen to have any green acrylic paint. So now we've got our earth looking very glittery and beautiful for the different continents and blue for the oceans. Um, you could even touch this up a little bit after letting it dry with some glue and some more glitter to get those land masses looking even more dense. Um, but in the meantime, it's got to go back out to its drying stand another 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and while one planet is drying, you can work on decorating your others. Here we've got each of the planets um, in order from their distance from the sun, starting with Mercury over there on the far right. Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now, these all are sized according to the PDF spreadsheet, um, the table for the relative sizes that we've included in the instructions uh, attached to this video here. Um, these are my artistic interpretations of each of the planets. Yours are going to be very different from mine, depending on which image you used as your reference, as well as your artistic abilities. Some of us are more skilled than others, um, and that's okay. <laughs> For Saturn, you'll notice that I've decided to paint my rings right on my planets, again, because I don't have construction paper at my house at the moment, but you can also create your rings um, using cardboard paper and then taping that around the planet and really getting that ring-like structure that we see in Saturn. It's so beautiful. Um, 
So now we've got all these, they're all dry, they're all ready to be actually constructed into the solar system. And this can be done in a few different ways. Now, I've already got all my planets attached to strings because that's how I chose to dry my planets um, after I painted them, by hanging. Uh, if you would like, you can string your different planets together according to the distance, uh, again, given in the attached instruction spreadsheet to this video. Um, so if you attach them by string, that would be really fun because then you could hang all your planets in your room as a nice decoration, um, maybe on your roof uh, to look at as if it were the galaxy above you, the, the, the night sky when you're sleeping. Um, you could also use a, a piece of cardboard, um, paint it black, and then have the planets on that piece of cardboard. Um, at their relative distances. You can also even use squares of toilet paper if you like. Um, again, toilet paper is hard to come by these days, but it's definitely one way to model how far you are from the sun. For an example, if you are going the squares of toilet paper route in uh, measuring out the distance that you need between your planets and the sun, just for humor's sake, you would need to set out approximately six sheets of toilet paper between the Sun and Mercury, which is the first planet from the Sun, and then from the Sun also to Venus, you would need 11 squares, from the Sun to Earth, 15, from the Sun to Mars, 23, to Jupiter, 78 squares of toilet paper, to Saturn, 140 squares of toilet paper, Uranus, 290, and Neptune, 450 squares of toilet paper. If you try this out, let me know how many rolls of toilet paper you end up using. I'm dying to find out. I just can't bring myself to use my own toilet paper, which is running quite low in uh, stock. One interesting thing to note is that Pluto, if we included it here as a planet, which it used to be considered, but is now considered a dwarf planet because of its small size, um, that would have needed 590 additional squares of toilet paper. So you're in luck that we're not including Pluto today.